everybody uh, to another one of Pharmacy Theater's wonderful workshops. Today we're going to do something unique and uh, we're going to workshop a sci-fi screenplay. So this was a project uh, that is an original science fiction that was mediated Funny. through the, uh, the to spec series another one of pharmacy Trek. theaters wonderful However, workshops uh, it, today we're going to do something it. unique and uh we're going to workshop a sci-fi screenplay so this was a project uh that is an original science fiction that was mediated Funny. through the, uh, the spec series another one of pharmacy Trek. theaters wonderful However, workshops uh, it, today we're going to do something it. unique and uh we're going to workshop a sci-fi hey screenplay. So yourself. this was a project uh, that is an original science fiction that was mediated through the, uh, the uh, spec series. Another one of our pharmacy theaters, wonderful. Oh, however, it's not. Don't you just love technology when it has a mind of its own? So we are back. Um, the glitch is fixed. So Josh, okay. you can go now. Okay, so all that fancy stuff aside, um, this could be me. This could be adapted for a purely original, uh, but for the sake of the project, it was done in a Star Trek format. So, the abstract: Star Trek has yet to exhibit a major area of its canon in detail, negating a focus on the very headquarters of Starfleet, their academy in San Francisco. This pilot hopes to, to hear the birth of a new series uh, in the Star Trek television empire that focuses primarily on Starfleet Academy and the people, faculty, and students from all over the universe that educate and learn therein. The aesthetic adheres to Trek traditions with focus shifting more toward Earth and away from space a priority. In Star Trek Academy, we're introduced to protagonists in a variety of spaces including professors' homesteads, a jazz cafe, and even a Klingon bar. Then, as the chief medical officer returns to his laboratory in sickbay, we experience a few Starfleet classes. This includes Professor Enriquez's exobotany lecture in pharmacognosy and Professor Lisa's positronics lecture on the Sun-style android updates. After inciting action with emergency alarms in sickbay, Dr. Jasper Doors, chief medical officer, deals head-on with the inciting actions that lead to the premising conflicts of this pilot episode. Additionally, a Klingon cadet traverses sexuality and identity issues, enduring a spiritual vision during a dream sequence. The major concern during this time is an identification computer chip that had been implemented as a mandatory requirement for Starfleet personnel. Through each character's experiences, we move within the storyline. Audiences learn of a biocentrism that may combat the egoism of the world. Utilizing some simpler definitions, the television pilot production, Memory Strain, will, will be analyzed in context to critical theories and science fiction. Discover fruitful scholarship and phenomenology covering major points of Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and their respective relation to Star Trek, dramaturgy, and screenwriting. Examinations in this analytical thesis include post-human theory, transhumanism, the uncanny valley effect, in context to the original project. So without further ado, we bring you a few selections from Memory Strain. The camera continues to zoom out until the frames mise en scene consists of an aerial view of New York City continuing until the clouds are pierced and space is reached. Q series theme soundtrack and opening credits. Dissolve opening sequence to Ryder's Pennsylvania home. Ritter, I apologize, it's Ritter's Pennsylvania home. Interior, Ritter's homestead, the study or den. Late evening, Dr. Sojourn Ritter sits at his desk dressed casually with rolled up sleeves. He is contemplative and relaxed reading. He remains undisturbed as a uniformed Admiral Kral Atush beams into the room. He's like officer. Actually, it's Lieutenant Commander now. 
I say I'm doing well for the shape the world's in. You know, there are stranger things out there than star voyages. Another bureaucratic demotion? Not just the one. The other was from the job change. How are you, Dr. Atos? Is the Academy still in one piece or have the Klingons returned for more primitive exchanges? Nope, no Klingons, my friend. Pray tell me, good man, what on this phonic paradise brings ye to my court? I'm done with the badge. It's not just, it's just not worth it. And you know it. Well, damn, Soji. I'm here to recruit you. I need you. Starfleet needs you. This is going to be an important year. Your work and the individual, individual, individualization of starship captains has proven invaluable. You've got to be kidding me. You're a funny guy, right? You're such a trickster. I'm not going through any dance. I know you declared your disinterest when you left, but I think you can get past it for the greater good. Past? Is the past really the past? Past what? The Federation's idea of the greater good involves suffering, injury of others, and xenocolonialism. Really, though? It's been so long. It's not just memories for better or worse. You weren't in that filthy place. God, the stink alone was unbearable. Only three Starfleet officers have ever escaped those prison mines. I'm aware, Archer, Kirk, and Dr. McCoy. Another lovely dance with death. I'm not proud of that our continuously courtesy of the Starfleet fleet. Brought to you by the Prime Directive. Come on. The vast zones of space are wild, dangerous, and untamed. Are you really going to blame the Federation? I'm done being pushed around. It's as if HQ Command annually forgets my service record and academy education due to lack of patriotism. That's ridiculous. The only reason I was demoted in the first place was for defending a shuttlecraft of refugees. First of all, at least you forget, young what, what young captain was waiting nearby with a ship? Rescue ready and waiting to beam you out of Rora Pente. Refugee innocence crawl. And that crime that resulted in demotion? How noble of you. Sometimes thinking once or twice is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> we have had some legendary times together. I must affirm this. I'm grateful for our friendship. I implore you to look at my situation outside of your own eyes. Remove the filters and allow yourself to truly see and gain wisdom from perception. You're right, Soji. But I still need a job. I have an interstellar humanitarian service university to run, and you have rising command graduates that need your approval to become starship captains. Oh, please. The Lake Department is nothing without you and your staff will not return as adjuncts without you to lead them. You've talked to the individuators. I cannot believe they gave you the time of day. No, of course I didn't talk to them, but I am supposed to tell the superintendent, commandant, and battalion commander that Starship Helms are no longer available because our team won't work? They won't do it. Christian's sake, brother, come back to San Francisco. You know as well as I that the Kobe, Kobe Ashumu is not enough. We need a chief feminatologist. Because the, because the because computer simulators should never be charged to evaluate humanity. Uh, you put such weight on my shoulders and expect us to continue as adjuncts. The team thinks they should receive credit where credit is due. So, look at my team of analysts. We are all adjunct facility who are not offered extended feder federation ECs or long-term contracts. Our time is just as valuable to Starfleet as any engineer or scientist, no? Uh, and what of the men and women of engineering and technology? They have higher ranks, receive higher pay, and garnered more respect from colleagues and leaders. Why should the individuation team or any other instructor be subjected to such neglect? 
Well, I. Why are our machines more important than our leadership? Somebody has to repair a fleet full of various vessels and spacecrafts. Are we really meant to continue on like this, like we have, as academic slaves to the Federation? No. I think no. I will continue to sit around polishing plasma injectors in the Pennsylvania countryside contently. Please, brother. I may be prepared to honor such requests if you return. No, I cannot return to do the Federation's spiritual dirty work. Frankly, I'm a little worn out of the whole wise full sage thing crawl. I like my writings and research. At least my life's work will go towards ending global and interstellar crime on Earth. No, I don't think I will be returning my old friend. It can be like the old days, just like the two years we spent in battle near Kronos. No, old days are gone. I won't subject my conscience to the Federation's demands. As long as the adjunct regulations are not reformed, the truth is that there is nothing you could say or offer me that would incline me to return. I was just notified on my command pad this morning. He hands Ritter an electronic tablet device that is open to a memo from the Dean of Cadets that reads, the Inspector General is coming to evaluate your new apart department. Is that so? Oh, that's what you meant by honoring requests. He reads on. Is that so? He sits at the desk and delicately sits down the pad. Yes, my old friend. The inspectors are coming to Starfleet and I have to use our main campus as a window for the Federation into the development of cosmic sight and the latest thesis on interstellar consciousness. This is bigger than you and your soul. Nope. Sorry, Crawl. I just won't return to fetch and heal for them anymore. Take my books. Stacks Here. books and documents in the Admiral's arms. Here, take my essays, outlines, and research. Just leave me be, okay? Not everyone shares your drive to please bureaucrats. Look at the end of the day. Look, at the end of the day, HQ will find a way to reach and maintain the individuators. Really? How is that? You have enough human psychology under your belt, Dr. Atos, so go ahead and handle it. Best of luck with the approach in cadet, cadet season. Admiral Atos turns to leave, stopping to look out the window at a full supermoon in the night sky. I see that adjunct faculty haven't received a fair contract. I will go, my friend. But know this. Any adjunct who returns on this year shall receive a custom piece of the pie title rank. Really? I don't think there are only seven of you. How difficult could it be? It would be devastatingly rough without you, but I respect where you stand, sir. It's just that there are so many M-class planets that could benefit from your work. Ritter joins Crawl at the window to gaze at the moon and stars. Crawl turns to face Ritter, who is gazing emptily, enveloped by the enveloped by the moon's face and light. I notice that you are still chopping and splitting logs with an axe. Don't understand why you don't just use a phaser for that. Not everything should be done quickly or artificially. You know this, Admiral. And Stoll and Vulcan are the only Menshara class planet droids that really benefit from my work. Ritter turns to face crawl. You look well. Take what you need. I'm a little overexhausted of the drama and danger at HQ and the Academy. You have your answer, a premier planetary psychology platform. Enjoy, sir, and take care. I know that I know you will consult with Dota Talk and Tagal. Consider how your family feels and thinks. Tagal is likely to be a cadet soon, and Dota and I exchange thoughts daily. Take care, my friend. You are always welcome here at my residence. However, the Academy Superintendent of Curriculum is not. One may only hope that you consider what we've discussed this evening before truly making a decision. I will send you a memo in the next round of instructor recruitment. 
I will not be changing my mind this time, sir. I wish you success with the inspection of the department. Admiral Crawl Athos taps his badge communicator. Chirp, chirp. Transporter room 12? Yes. One to beam over. Heard, locking on your coordinates, sir, waiting for your command. Just as the Admiral firmly plants a pose for the transporter to dematerialize and teleport him back to HQ, he taps his badge communicator. Transporter 12, cancel that order. Admiral, are you okay? Yes, no trouble. Just forgot I have another appointment before returning to headquarters. Affirmative, sir. Room 12, standing by. Chirp, chirp. Do you still consume Romulan ale? Or perhaps Thaurian brandy from time to time? What? What? Take me for a drink around here? Well, Crawl, this is certainly a fascinating log card you have played. Who's oh, asking? Krog. Oops. Crawl gleefully grins in his linguistic victory. Who's asking, my dear old friend or Admiral Atos, superintendent? Your friend, naturally. Is there a local war nog stand in, those, in this region or not? You've got some nerve. Coming way out here, I suppose your visit will warrant the human exchange of libation in a public, socially constructed environment. But don't think for a second my decision will, stri will stray. Cut to local bar lounge. Okay, so that's the end of the scene. Um, and I have a few questions. I have a few notes that I made too. Um, what, can you just explain like in layman terms what's going on for the people who don't know anything about Star Trek can understand what just happened? Yes. Like Sarah, okay, so Alex, there, and me. There's a lot of words in there. So first thing, let me clarify that to Jesse, who's a shame to me, I mixed up a lot of the, the position terms, but that's something that can be corrected. That's fine. Um, but to, to clarify, I forgot uh, Soji Ritter is half Vulcan, half human without pointy ears. That's an important uh, backstory. You're a, you're a half Vulcan with round human ears. Okay. And, and one more thing actually about the name Soji. Soji is a character on the new Picard show. Can I tell you that I wrote this two years before that? Oh, did you? Okay. I've already binged Picard. And also, oh, the you themes, did. All right. The themes, I wrote this two years before they did that. But ah. anyway, mo moving on to Gaul is your wife uh, who, who resides on Vulcan with your children, Ritter. Uh, okay, so what's happening in this scene? It's, uh, it's the, this scene I was one of the first scenes I wrote. It was the first scene I wrote, actually. And again, we're going out of order, you know. Uh, it, we're not doing the full script, but this is one of the first scenes I wrote because I didn't write it in a linear way. Uh, but this was one of the scenes that was most enjoyable and e easy to write because this is in all the Star Trek. I, and I should note that I, I spent a couple years researching Star Trek before I ever attempted any of this. Um, I even spent the time to binge every single episode, including the animated series. Thank you, Netflix, at the time. Um, but uh, so what's happening is the traditional, you go to get the, 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 if we're thinking mythology, so outside of Star Trek, you go to get the hero to return for the journey. And uh, in Star Trek, there's always like a, no, hell no, I'm not doing that. Or And tied to that, there's always a, let's go get drunk and do it anyway. Uh, so that's this is sort of the, the grab the hero on the threshold scene. And, and it has lots of the, it, there's little like sprinklings of, of fun stuff in there, like the line about um, why, why, aren't you, why are you using an ax to split wood? You have phasers, you can do it in two seconds if you really want to have a, or do your holographic fire, you know, like all kinds of other options in with the technology, but Ritter decides that he prefers cutting with an axe. But but that's what's happening. We're we're getting the hero to jump back on the horse and he says no. Uh, so his his past friend says, Well, let's just go get drunk. And 
You don't know this, but I'm pretty sure in the next scene, when they get drunk, he convinces them to go. And then, and then we move on to the next scene. That's the scene we're skipping, is the scene where uh, he's like, nope, I'm not going. But like, then we have a close-up where he ended up, we, we have some action notes where Ritter does show up at Starfleet in uniform after, after the next morning from saying no while drunk. So classic Star Trek, right? Jesse, confirm? Yes, yeah. Um, the first example I can think of, they did something like this in Voyager. So, like Every in the first series. episode. So, Every series. yeah. McCoy, so this is pretty popular. There's, yeah, there's usually some arm twisting involved. So, this is McCoy and Kirk 101. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, other questions to the lay audience or anybody? Um, Alex has one, but she doesn't know how to unmute herself. So, give me a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Thanks. Um, so what's your audience for this? Like, are you trying to get Star Trek fans or are you trying to get like new people into Star Trek? So my response is that um, from the get go, I always knew that with science fiction and spec scripts, you want to be ready to, to it either has to be original that, that, that you could pitch to an existing franchise or it should be spec to a franchise that you could, if someone was like, well, we like it, but Star Trek doesn't like it. And I had to in a pinch switch it to something original. I feel that with my themes on Academy and such, it can be altered. It's been done in other mediums and fashions um, as far as Star Trek is concerned, but you bet your ass that it would be nice to appeal to Star Trek itself. So, so the idea is, is to appeal to any sci-fi uh, interested person, but it, but I am really, I, I did a lot of, I spent most of my time researching the Star Trek because I wanted to be able to, um, the number one thing I learned is that it has to be believable. It doesn't have to be real, it has to be believable. Um, so I, I, I guess to answer the question in short is, yeah, I want to appeal to Star Trek and new people. And I mean, okay. I think like I don't know what the tone. Is. It's also I, hard to do. Let's also make a hard note here that it is difficult to, without any kind of tech, to give you a film screen experience. Um, so some of us that were used to workshopping stage scripts, you know, it's still. You have to kind of, I don't know, Austin, give me a word, like not shift, but like you have to kind of get into your headspace as opposed to visualizing the stage. Use you know? your imagination. Imagination. Conceptualize. I think for me, like that first scene is, I think I'd like it to just be like a little lighter in like vocabulary. I mean, I know it probably comes like <laughs> middle of the scene, but I think like, you know, he's kind of run off to Pennsylvania. He's not involved in the academic life. So I think I'd find him a little bit more rugged and less like, oh, I used to be a professor. Right. I agree. So Carl comes off as very formal speaking as well, um, especially because... Yeah, especially because he says my friend at least five times throughout the entire scene. That's a good uh, that was note. something that I noticed. That's a he, good note. Yeah. Mother, a couple, three times. Yeah, he's, he says it a lot. Um, that's one thing that kept coming out at me. Because I'm like intrigued, like I don't get Star Trek, but I'm kind of like curious about like, oh, what's the Academy like? But I think of it from a more like, girly dramatic standpoint of like oh there's gonna be like we'll get to your scene we'll get to your scene but uh you'll you'll like but yeah i just think it needs like a little bit of more playfulness like i think like there i know there's like a level of seriousness like from what i know of star trek but just having like a little bit more 
Go ahead, Dan. Dan. He's like a hard ass, but I think also kind of that playfulness. I got you. Ashley agrees. Dan, what were you saying? I was saying that she has to remember that the character of Ritter is half Vulcan. And Vulcans don't play too much. So he's going to be, right. he's going to be, you know, more serious. He's not, Vulcans don't play. So. Oh, like, I think it depends heavily on the location of the scene. This, of course, would not, uh, I'm assuming this wouldn't be like the first scene that you see in an episode. That's absolutely correct. This is yeah. not the opening yeah. scene. This is, what page should we start on? Uh, page three, four. three or four. Okay, so there are a couple other scenes that happen. You know, with uh, with screenplays, there's often a lot of notes and and stuff in it of stuff that you would see a whole bunch of stuff before we get to the first scene with lines. And when you take the time to create, when you would produce this, you would obviously direct the acting. You know, pace it out and all that. But but. Uh, but all things considered, I think we got a, a if, if all we do today is have good conversation and get some of the good like empirical notes out, like like figuring out how many times Carl says my friend, um, noticing that I need to clarify who, whose job is what their job, you know, like there's a couple job titles in there. Um, but if that's what we get out of it, I'm happy. Um, other other comments for this first selection. I think we're good to move on to the next scene. Okay. So we're, what's that? Okay. So we are, my wife is making sure that I'm taking everyone's notes. Just to clarify, I am. Uh, So we're going to page 17. Interior, downtown jazz cafe in San Francisco. Mellow weather. Night. David and Lisa enter the cafe in civilian, modern, as we know in Star Trek, androgynous looking clothing, and proceed to a table and begin a conversation. Her sleeves are rolled up to the elbow, exposing a forearm tattoo of the 12 known planetoid bodies along the forearm. In the Terran galaxy, at least. Uh, In a curved line from elbow fold to wrist. A hologram of a of Cannonball Adderley, the famous jazz musician, his quartet is playing Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. The club is populated, but not overly crowded. The atmosphere is pleasant, and a server comes to take their drink order. Sorry and Brandy, please. Just your smallest vessel of Canar. I just don't see why you couldn't start bringing her out with us more. Just because she's a prototype doesn't mean you couldn't experiment a little. She, come on, David, you can't really. Why are you not more passionate about your work? What I do as a student in the engineering lab is exciting, but your adjunct research in developing the most advanced program since Professor Data's creation, it's more than a task or project. It's going to become a being, Lisa. The drinks arrive at the table as an awkward interruption. Seriously, you you have to tone it down in public a little. You said it yourself. This is important work. This is sensitive stuff. I don't want getting out or into the wrong hands. Unit 2514 should remain in the lab until the positronics have stabilized. Here, taste this. It's very subpar. Hmm. It's not so bad. Admiral Litos and Commander Ritter are going to be coordinating something with Android Design during the inspection next month. He slides back the glass of Kanar. Sorry. I suppose the Kanar is, um, kind of not so good. He pulls her from her funk as the two laugh their way to the dance floor. Just as they arrive, the tune picks up speed and the two enjoy themselves performing like professional choreographed dancers, including the song. The two return to their table with smiles. Wow, I forgot you can really shake a leg. (laughs) And your tail feather, too. The music slows and decrescendos again to Etta James or Ella Fitzgerald's At Last in the background as they continue to converse. 
I really want to get Unit 2514's component square so the inspection performed records it as a valuable program and it doesn't get cut. I know the Federation staff can get carried away. One minute we're creating jobs and opportunities, the next we are erasing them because the budget wasn't approved after the fact. Hoping the review board covers my six too. He pulls out a little pad and uses voice command to operate. Computer, magnify image 441 of unit 2514. image of Lisa. See, I'll shut down and prep for project continuance. Aw, so cute you tuck her in and everything. Uh, no, 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 no. And you are way too silly to be a Starfleet officer. Are you certain you're not some advanced and attractive Borg model? Uh, I love it when you talk robotics to me. Say, there are a few reports of trilithium resin overflows that need addressed when we return in the morning. As long as we can stop in the positronics bay? I need that teleconverter chip. I just know Tashol will be on my back. Maybe she wouldn't be such a hard ass if she got laid more than once every seven years. <coughs> to earn her lieutenant pip before I finish my positronics project. Don't sweat it, Ensign. You want to get out of here? Returning to quarters would be acceptable. Just don't call me Ensign, okay? I don't want to be looked at or judged. Okay. It's not like I'm your technician or anything. We work in different wings. Are you taking me back to the holodeck? Your quarters or mine? I thought we could, I don't know, listen to some jazz, enjoy a drink, discuss stellar cartography. But if you want to give her all she's got, then I suppose I will have to engage. As the couple walks out the door, a large youthful Klingon in a red cadet uniform walks past them on the sidewalk and focus is transferred to him as the camera pans along his city walk. David and Lisa disappear. Cut. I love the playfulness. I do. Um, Very flirty. Um, <laughs> Such a fun scene. It is. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was that was wonderful. So and have I redeemed myself even though I like Shakespeare? Oh yeah. <laughs> and Jesse, you I'm so glad to have you with us because you just roll those words like trilithium. It just rolls I, techno babble. <laughs> I wasn't even I don't look I wasn't even looking at the screen. I'm like following I thought I wanted to look at faces, but like following along I can like hear it and see it for my you know in my head and yeah, that was a good one. Um, I even well, could you. hear the jazz music. Josh. Cool. Yes. This scene that they just read, I think does what Alex was asking for in the first scene. Precisely. Um, it gives us a nice look into Lisa and David, and I actually understand who they are as characters beyond just their like star trek persona like smart and they do so much cool stuff but i know who they are as people and that um is important to draw in an audience that isn't already in the star trek canon yeah i feel like it's really well written the care exactly what austin said said the um characters were well well a little well written but you still like i like how it was cute or funny where personality slip in there that i'm kind of a genius working on really cool stuff and then we're back to the banter it was really well done so, so thank you and before we continue i was just going to say alex and everybody to clarify the idea of star trek is always you have about 45 46 minutes whatever variation to engage everyone from you know sarah stevenson's to the jesse forney's and the idea and i'm glad we did scene selections austin did a good job at picking out that you know and that's what i kind of try to do is have a scene for everybody and star trek does this good because they usually have a ton of protagonists and they do what eleanora just described where yes there's some of the trek stuff but then we you know we get a little funny with it you know, we, we, where we have the little witty plays on words and, and it gets that, okay. And then if you're like Alex Sauer's taste, uh, she likes that kind of a genre with the boy meets girl. And that's what we have here. And I wanted to clarify an empirical note that I forgot at the last minute of this project, I changed it. The, the Android that is a part of the love triangle is not identical to David but identical to Lisa. And part of that had to do with the Bechdel test. I, I really wanted to do as much female 
strength in this piece as I could. Uh, so I thought last minute uh, the android that's a part of their love triangle is actually identical to Lisa. Uh, it's reminding me a lot of scenes that you would get in Ten Forward and Next Gen, where uh, absolutely, you, yeah. Given that I was thrown under the bus, Joshua, about knowing nothing about Star Trek, um, I do, I also am kind of like Alex in that I like the slice of life scenes. So this scene with David and Lisa is very much the kind of thing that I, as a reader and as a television consumer, enjoy seeing. It's like Austin said, it's them outside of the academy or outside of their work and it, we get to see who they are individually as well as who they are as a couple which is nice i i really love that too and i think that's one big consistent thing throughout star trek you know there has to be this these moments of levity uh, and that's what makes star trek relatable i mean even to people who have never sat down and watched an episode like if you'd sit down you're not seeing characters that are light years away from you it's just like there's such a human element What's yeah, that? That, was, that was the thing I took away from the scene. Is it's it's like you yeah. could you could see two, you know, normal Penn State professors or Penn State students right. having this kind of conversation. They're bantering. They're having real life conversations. But at stacks. But a, yeah, at stacks at Biscottis. But they're occasionally throwing in. Well, this is what I'm working on for X, Y, and Z project. This is what I'm doing for you know my dissertation. Blah blah blah. So it's easy to kind of put yourself in those in a scene like that, which I appreciate and I enjoy. Feel free to unmute yourselves. We're on take five. We're at scene. So. All day is the shortcut, if that helps. <laughs> like, you have a little button, but alt A is what I've been using. Okay, alt A. Mm -hmm. oh, I just use I just use my touch bar on my, my MacBook. I think so. it's the space bar, too. Look. I just click the, the space button. Bar. Click the button. <laughs> I got a funny little microphone up Tim here. Tim and Dave, I'd like to hear. Sorry, did somebody chime in? I, I was saying something funny. Move on. <laughs> How dare you? Um, yeah, I know. No, uh, Tim, Dave, let's hear the your guys' responses from two scenes. They need unmuted, I guess. I'm good. Um, Tim's got it. I really like that last scene a lot. I've been a Trekkie since the first first showing of the original Star Trek. I'm that old. Um, I really like that scene. I like the way you guys played off each other. And I think the way it was the writing that was good, but it was even more the way you guys played the characters. I thought that really brought it home. We love his background too. I mean, Tim and I know I can't get over your background. <laughs> oh, you too, Jesse. You're at least uh, one super fan. Yeah. I'll say his is better though. <laughs> Dave, you got anything? I don't know why you humans are so emotional about this. I think it's all just normal. And I do appreciate Sarah bringing in Penn State rather than Kentucky, because we don't want Tim to hear anything about Kentucky. And you. <laughs> Is there some uh, background to that? <laughs> So, uh, okay. Uh, is there anyone, any other comments or, or does anyone need to take any real break before we continue? I'm good. Perfect. Okay. Well then, uh, where's the next, is it, we're at the uh, bottom of page 20. we continue right from where we were? No, we're in the bottom of page 23. Okay. So we're skipping what, uh, Teju gets mugged, I guess, by some we're skipping that dick part. Klingons. But we're skipping that. Yep. Okay. So bottom of 23, bottom half of 23. So um, exterior, Starfleet Academy, morning. Doors returns to continue his research in the lab. We see him in our sick bay. Camera cuts to aerial extra credit cadets in their class A uniforms and they're beginning to beam onto campus transporter pads as we hear music build. And the, the song I, I use is Simon and Garfunkel's Only Living Boy in New York. So if you know that song, things, and it envelops our experience as these various cadets are just, they're appearing on campus, returning as the, the this school year begins. Um, 
So it's this big, uh, how do we, a big scene with cutting of different cadets with their family, where they are, that kind of thing. Uh, cadets and faculty return to the academy and engage in educational activities and training exercises all over campus in landscape and facilities montage. That's the word I was saying, montage. Uh, different huddles of extras converse with energy. We see an old groundskeeper tending to the hedges and gardens meticulously with grace as he puts down the trimmers to engage in an ASL, American Sign Language, conversation with a hearing impaired cadet. Ensign Singh and Meta beam onto campus and join the active crowds. David and Lisa are seen walking on campus. Kato dematerializes in his apartment in uniform and rematerializes on campus all during the Simon and Garfunkel music. The soundtrack fades out and we hear the normal sounds expected at a college campus. We have a long shot that follows some cadets into a building and down a busy hall. You would not believe the books in that film last night. Beautiful film, yes. I can't believe they had so many archaeologists in their family. Yes, this film was definitely worth concluding our onk work session earlier last night. David and Lisa catch up to the group. Dave needs unmuted. Oh, my picking up after the faculty yes. officer. What was the film? It sounds fascinating. Oh, you all went to? <laughs> Sorry, sir. We went to see Mud Jones and the Temple of Time. Another installment of Indiana's great grandson. Excellent. Let's go separate ways at the wing intersection. Cut to sick bay. Dr. Doors walks into his office via sick bay. The protagonist's professional spaces are established through a long take that involves crossing walls of each door as he passes through. As he passes an open classroom, we overhear an interstellar pharmacognosy seminar given by Professor Enriquez, chemical officer. The camera pans forward into the classroom. Interior, classroom. Our taxi, Volpanoida. What is its most important scientific notes? Anybody? Became a practical plant medicine in the 21st century on earth that on earth that eradicated over 20 21 known diseases that's right we have a great deal of this particular plant hell it is the precise reason i was able to get to class my roommate gabriella's cruiser doesn't move without it as long as there are new volpinas to be discovered in the lab we will continue to adapt this natural resource as needed to improve medical conditions and fuel our vehicles and small aircrafts. As Enriquez concludes her last line, the camera pans through the wall into the next classroom, a robotics lab in progress, interior positronics bay. Professor Lisa is addressing a class of uniformed cadets in a laboratory type classroom. Each cadet has a small toolkit and various partial constructions of a positronic androids, ranging from half bodies to simply a head propped upright. The positronic brain, as it were, is the main prop being worked on. Each unit has a centrally located patch of hair and scalp that is in the open position, essentially a 90 degree flap, uh, exposing the circuits and wires being worked on. Each student works on their programmer's pad that is connected wirelessly. Go ahead and attach the positronic simulator for regulation. Now, other than artistry or the knowledge versus experience principle, what are the ways we evaluate these Noonien Sung style androids? Who can name all the ways? The cadets all zealously raise their hands in hopes of being called upon, except for one mysterious human cadet sitting in the back. He's working away without care for the lecture. He has very long, shoulder-length red hair and beard. Cadet Trago? A long pause as the cadet continues to work. Trago! Eleonora? Go again, Professor. And she's muted. So go again with your line, Elizabeth, uh, the startling one. Trago! 
Yes, Professor. What are the seven ways we evaluate songs? Seven? Well, in developmental order? Yes, of course. List them, Cadet. Well, the first is ability to process touch and smell. Next, motor coordination and reflexes. This is followed by visual comprehension and data application. Then social skills and personal interaction, followed by human response to simulation. Very good, Trego. So finally, when we get to the good stuff, where will they establish a purpose or reason for being or identify a primary function, determining normal parameters? Then they will begin to question and expand perception if all training and tests are successfully completed. But that's only seven. Only? Professor, do you not include the eighth as neuroduplicity? Is cadet transfer not to be evaluate, evaluated? Ah, uh, yes, neuroduplicity. Who can tell us why this would be important to evaluate here while your design is still in the positronics bay? Really? Cascade failure, as with Dr. Dada's prototype law, due to the hyperpolarization variable. Very good, cadet. What are some of the ways we evaluate for cascade failure? Trego. Oh, uh, quantum level variations, Professor. That's uh, that's correct. But tell me, Trego, what are those quantum variations that we monitor? Trego takes a beat to finish a calculation. His classmates stare up him in disapproval, perhaps crossed arms. He then looks up with a smile to answer Lieutenant Lisa confidently. Positronic matrix activity records, behavioral norms, real patterns, and general heuristicity. Okay, then you've made it this far. How do we monitor these categories? Oh, Professor, please, this is easy. We developed a quality control method through Android interviews. Excellent work. Clearly, you have kept up in the reading. Oh, I'm boldly beyond reading. Lisa concludes her lecture. Next week, we will discuss the ethical implications of neurotransfers and introduce you to submicron matrix transfer technology. Just four weeks from today, you will be evaluated on your ability to lay down neural net pathways with complexity applications. Additionally, be prepared for your projects to choose an appearance and or sex. The camera then pans or cranes back out to the hall, following Dr. Doris' shoulder point of, as a point of view shot. He finally arrives at his office and sits down. Exhaling into the chair, he begins typing at his station. And that's the scene. So um, at this point, I'm just going to say it, that I think Lisa Miller is my favorite character. Uh, Good. Just so you he know, is one of the that, main like, protagonists. I found a connection to your work there. Thank you. I like Trago. I've been Trago. <laughs> I like Trago. I like Trago too. Definitely like that cliche, self-important engineer. I mean, I, I love it. <laughs> I didn't even take him as self-important. I felt like he was very just above it all. And because I feel like there are two know-it-alls in class. There's the one who knows they know it all and wants everyone to know. And then there's the know-it-all who's like, can you just leave me alone and know everything and <laughs> do my own thing? So Trago is my, he, I said it in the script, uh, there's a word in that scene, Trago is my wild card. He is, he, she, they, it, I said he has long hair and beard. He's based off a student I, I had at uh, Stevens College who literally looked like a Viking, uh, but, uh, but he was just like that, where I agree with Eleonora that there is also a type that you can be humble and be like that. I mean, I've learned it as an educator. I, I know it from other things, you know. Uh, Trago isn't an asshole. I don't feel that. Again, I don't know his, what his arc is because he's a wild card protagonist, but uh, but I definitely never saw wrote him or saw him as a asshole. He just happens to be very smart and also distracted or whatever. Other comments. This is again one of those scenes where, like, the fucking train. <laughs> this is another one of those scenes where, like, we're in the academy and, like, we're seeing the characters as professors and as a student, but it's still a relatable character, which is, again, I think what Jesse was alluding to earlier, and that all of the Star Trek is like that. It, it, it provides you with characters that are relatable. But listening to 
Trego and Lisa's characters, I was like, oh, yeah, I've been in Lisa's place. I've had to, you know, listen to a student rattling off answers and, like, having that academic banter with a student in my English classes. So, like, it was another one of those moments where I was like, ah, yes, I appreciate this because I can connect to it. I don't feel like I'm being spoon-fed too much, like, sci-fi information. So Sarah and Austin and I, and, and I don't know about anyone else on the group, but we're uh, adjunct uh, professors and have, have done have a lot of experience with what's going on with college students now. And I agree 100% that you kind of learn as you go that, like Eleanor said, there's a spectrum to these students that are, you know, cynical and distracted. <laughs> A uh, really minor thing, just straight at the beginning of the scene, you were um, giving some examples of things that go around campus. Um, I know this is mostly unrelated to the scene, but I noticed the ASL um, thing, which I thought was really cool because Star Trek has always been about inclusion. Um, my, the first thing that I thought of, though, was how deafness would be treated, what would be translate to star trek era because for example we have jordy laforge who is blind but has his visor um it would if it's something that you choose to play around with um how much of asl is more chosen because it's cultural because yes we have cochlear implants right now but what would it look like in a few hundred years that kind of deal first of all i'm so happy you asked i'm, I'm so happy we're talking about this because um this is something i know a little bit of american sign language yeah me too uh, <laughs> yeah. but but i uh this is i'll tell you right now and i'm so happy somebody asked this because i didn't know if it would come up or not it's a super important part of this project was uh one of my closest friends is uh mostly deaf his wife is 100 percent deaf their kids can hear um and I also have a, one of my best friends in the world uh, is 100% blind uh, since he was six. Uh, some of you might know Don Gooey. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so things like that. And, you know, as a DEI professional, as we first see equity inclusion, I very much am drawn to that. Uh, I have my own reasons for feeling subaltern, but. Uh, but what I've learned from my good friend uh, who is hearing impaired um, is that not everybody likes the cochlear. Uh, apparently there was some uh, research uh, conducted that concluded that in just like with uh, intersexuality, uh, where there was a period of time where doctors were just correcting this at birth without consulting parents, there's also been cases of cochlears being implanted without informing or consulting the parents. I know that there's a huge rift um, in the deaf community in terms of people feeling alienated from deaf culture. Marlene Matlin has spoken about it as well um, because um, I think Niles DeMarco said that about only 2% of parents of deaf children actually end up learning ASL. And so a lot of parents end up going for the cochlear as just a way that they don't have to learn ASL. So yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So just expanding upon that, their, their kids are excellent with sign language. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it's easier to talk to kids because of, you know, I feel like I talk like a baby when I use ASL, uh, uh, but, you know, spelling the signs you don't know. Uh, but, uh, but their kids are really good with sign. But, but that's something I learned. And I also had a, worked in kitchens uh, for many years where I actually had the experience to train people uh, to work as line chefs and cooks uh, in French, Spanish, and ASL. And because my friend who uh, that I'm speaking of, he had been my original trainer so many years ago. So I actually was trained to prep chef by someone who used ASL and then so on and so forth. In the future, I ended up working with someone who had a cochlear and was able to make uh, friends with them and sort of have this kind of multiple uh, diverse understanding of this thing that most people don't give two seconds of thought. And, and this is truly something that I think as, um, you know, social media, people are organized just like uh, little people, uh, people who are ASL like to organize with social media and stuff. 
I think that today it's such a, it's going to eventually become some kind of current uh, issue that to be addressed, unless it's been addressed. Uh, but but you would think of the common thought uh, is that everybody wants to hear uh, and that the cochlear is a savior to people who are deaf and the opposed opposition says, well, that's a little bit invasive of my body uh, to put a device in my head as a small child or baby um, when I could just uh, see what happened because it changes as you get, you know, throughout your life. You see what happens. You can learn ASL, uh, all kinds of ways that you can uh, be just, just well prepared without uh, having to invade your body that way, uh, especially against your will. Um, I feel like I totally hijacked the topic because this is about oh. this is about Trago and Lisa. But if for That's anyone fine. who's interested, one of my favorite episodes of Next Gen is Loud as a Whisper, where a mediator named Reva. Uh, I was just going to mention that. Yeah, and he oh, he mediates because he had uh, he has a telepathic connection with uh, three people um, who represent three different parts of his, um, identity. So highly recommend that. Yeah. It's amazing. One of my favorite Star Trek episodes ever. Always, always, always is about identity. I mean, they, they do gender, sexuality, all of it. And, and he was really deaf, the actor, which I mean, at the time, oh, wasn't. oh yeah. Uh, at the time, I mean, for a good, good while, a lot of um, TV shows and movies didn't bother actually being inclusive when it came to actual actors, um, because what extra effort? That's not actually effort. That's <laughs> mind blowing. Um, but no, he was. A, it, it was a huge thing. So that's another thing of our time is is you know we had the Black Panther uh, and a lot of a lot of other things today where it's important to have everybody represented and something that wasn't addressed. You know, we've been fighting these other struggles since, okay, the forties when we, and stuff like that. But, but nowadays there are other things that I think will, will be going to fix. I mean, that's one of those things is to answer your question and bring us back, uh, Eleonora is that my intention and it's in my description of my full script is to always cast for disability and and i know jesse might have something to say but in star trek they would say in actual canon they would probably tell us that uh that it went they did something like a cochlear or they found some kind of magical thing believable thing that because a lot of disabilities don't exist in star trek universe quote unquote or they do, they but they rare. tweak it. Like Jordy is right. still blind, but he, but, but they, they make give him, him AI to yeah. see. And right, he doesn't but, see like a normal person. Right, but also going back to the 23rd century, Kirk needed to wear glasses because he was allergic to a drug oh, uh, to, yeah. to correct eye vision. So, so that they, was, uh, I would say that was touched on in Rathacon. And then briefly again in the voyage home, and then that was it. So, so this is the other topic besides disability inclusion and awareness. Which, so first, Eleanor, yes, I always intended to have. I want that, especially you start with the B roll. Next thing you know, you're going to have a full protagonist. I'd love to have a protagonist that only used ASL and had a reason why they didn't want AI incorporated in their body. That's a big theme. Not wanting AI in your body is this transhumanism versus posthumanism. I'd like to table till our final discussion, but I really appreciate it coming up because yes, that is, the, so yes, we have the identity stuff going on, uh, but we also have the AI stuff, the AI versus human body stuff going on. So um, thank you for bringing us to that, uh, both of you, because that is yes, thank you with the Star Trek research and it's, Huge with my uh, mission, but just to bring us back, yes, uh, I that would be some of the what you would see on the screen, and I think that that's the biggest thing. I mean, you know, okay, vision impaired aside, the biggest thing for all the rest of the masses is to see it. So casual it's, inclusion uh, is a huge deal. Like when you show us that something isn't even like you don't even have to focus on it. 
then it's just kind of like it's it's normal it exists well, yeah, yeah my thought my organic. thought was it's 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 incredibly it feels incredibly organic no one like it it's not there's no attention drawn to it no no attention is drawn from any of the characters it's just mm -hmm. we understand that this is how this is and you know we we are inclusive and accepting and i, I yeah, feel yeah the like, only reason i brought it up was just in case like if that were to be an organic thing in the background um just to keep mindful that might some people might be like well we're in the 23rd century why are people still using asl it's just that's some a question that's what that i mean up. is i'd like to you know maybe the maybe we have a character added before b or whatever you know that's a tweakable later thing but but i feel you and i wanted i always wanted to have you have to remember this the characters you're seeing today are only a portion uh you got a lot of the main protagonists but there's you know other stuff that is in a big book of notes you know on my computer that didn't make it to the pilot but but yes i want to have a character that is either blind and or deaf and has an excuse a human ex a human reasoning why they didn't want whatever was the norm for star trek uh disability does that make sense so it could be, a, it oh, could yeah. be any disability but but i'd like it to be you know asl would be great a, a hearing impaired person that has a reason that they didn't want a cochlear or whatever the star trek equivalent hey josh makes sense so uh but but just to wrap up that josh, scene was uh before you wrap up yeah. listen to me uh, <laughs> so in the comments um on the I can't even see him. Someone mentioned that the scripts are like she said one thing I always loved about Star Trek is that they don't just write in in like the inclusiveness. Um the actors hired also show inclusiveness too. Can you just touch real quick about the um actors that would actually be hired to play these characters because I know that um all of these characters are very diverse um and it's named but can you just talk about that real quick before we move on to the next scene? Okay, so... I want to say I am going to work. I had a lot of fun. I'll watch the rest of this later. Goodbye, friends. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Sarah. Okay, so um, the first thing I'll do is I will address what inclusion is because not everybody knows what we're talking about. It'll take me two seconds. It's my favorite lesson uh and then i'll tell you what austin's talking about in regards to my script and star trek in general so equity or inclusion is really about so we say equality right that was the first battle in the 60s okay equality uh that's everybody gets a free t-shirt right if we imagine that everyone gets a free t-shirt that would be equality now equity or an inclusion statement or action rather would be that everybody gets a free t-shirt in their size you see the stipulation equality y'all get a free t-shirt doesn't mean it's going to fit you doesn't mean it's going to be your size if we all get a free t-shirt in our size that sounds a little better uh but uh specifically regarding this uh television show and star trek in general I wrote these characters in a way that they could be any species. Some of them are specifically human or specifically some species, but a lot of my characters I didn't specify. And I wrote a note that some of my uh, front matter talks about do your best to cast people. You know, you can write some of these characters as aliens. Alien is a great medium because it can represent anyone in alienation. Um, but but also specifically try to cast people that are very diverse especially for the human characters um it's not necessary to have a, a white man captain uh that's a good sentence there um so so uh, specifically austin i guess it's the idea of creating parts that our avenues for as many of those uh, themes uh, as you can. Uh, can you elaborate, Austin? I think that you uh, you touched on uh, some good things there. Um, but so before we move on to the next scene, um, just one more comment that 
um, popped up in the um, live stream is that how do you have a cochlear that? implant that that basically means like you can never have an MRI and like balance could be off. So those are kind of those risks that people don't understand. Um, like hearing people don't understand those risks. So that could be something you can play with too. That like, oh, like I work with like this kind of stuff. So that won't work for me. Um, which could also be specifically saying, like, you're like, I can't have a cochlear implant because I work with too much like magnets and whatever in the lab. It's precisely. So that is exactly what you do is we would, so dramaturgically, we would take the hard research of the complaints mm -hmm. related to an actual device, and we would consult someone like Jesse and say, what words, do, or me, you know, I like to make up words, uh, you know, we can come up with our own Star Trek world device that is the equivalent, and then for each of those <laughs> hard evidence experiences in reality, we can come up with a Star Trek equivalent. Right. I'm um, sorry, this is completely unrelated, but can we just look at Dave and just the... <laughs> no, I don't know what's going on What's with going Dave. on there? <laughs> he's like experimenting with backgrounds or something. Right? He's, he's just he's this good. ghost. He life. is the background. Oh, man. Um, uh, but anyway, the next scene <laughs> is very interesting. Um, it's on page 43 for y'all um, in, the, in the actual chat. Um, this is a scene I didn't um, actually choose in the original lineup. But Josh had count, uh, had said to me that this was important um, to the actual pilot, but also important to tell the full story if we're just going to pick five scenes. So, um, Josh, page oh. 43. Hey, uh, sorry, before we get rolling, Josh, I just wanted to say one thing here. I absolutely love the way that you wrote the characters to be diverse and also ambiguous because that's the way almost every Star Trek character has been written since the 80s. They are a character that can be played by somebody of any gender or any race. First thing I like, noticed, yeah. Yeah, they, they don't have that box. You know, if we're going to go out into the final frontier, you need to have a crew of people who, who aren't inside a box. And I think job. you definitely mirrored, like, original productions fantastically. So I just wanted to say that. You did a um, good job, Josh. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So um that ambiguity for me at least, I discovered that uh hyper analyzing Moby Dick with Dr. Mazes, uh where like word for word I esoterically broke down that whole book. Uh so I'm sure that that's where Star Trek gets a lot of you know, they like those old books, Shakespeare, oh yeah, Al Bill, all that. You know, old like, yeah, like, Hemingway, Milton. Oh yeah, you see it everywhere. Um, Can we get okay? This so now? yeah, let's hey. get into the plot. So, just to <laughs> set the scene before we get into the screen, this is important to Tadeuk's arc. So again, we're just doing scene selections today, so we're kind of getting glimpses of these characters' lives as opposed to, you know, not everything is unfolding for us in one scene. But but this is the I thought that since we had some strong uh, Trek people casted, that we ought to uh, bring some of the harder scenes out. So, so we'll go ahead then without uh, further ado. We have Doors, Teju, and Basai Master. Okay. All right. Esoterically, Teju, dream sequence, sick bay, night. After their first counseling session with Dr. Doors, Young Teduch is not feeling balanced enough to return to duty. So Doors assigns him a private bed in sickbay. I'm sorry you're oh. having difficulty sleeping still, Cadet. You're welcome to use this space as your quarters until you're reassigned. Teduch sits down gratefully in an attempt to try for comfort. Thank you, sir. I hope I'm not going to be an inconvenience to you or sickbay. Not at all. This compartment's on the end, and we aren't as busy since we started removing the chirps and the admiral started taking us seriously. Try and rest. The hypso spray should be kicking in now. And, um, no. The exhausted Klingon cadet turns over. So that, that direction is how we hear it as the Klingon falls to sleep. The exhausted Klingon cadet turns over and after three or four blinks, closes their eyes and doses and 
and dozes off as the screen transitions into Tayduk's unconscious. We hear the humming drone of a ship engine abruptly fall silent. We see brilliantly, brilliantly bright light as his eyes open and strain from the sight of a large being appearing to emerge from the wall. The cadet abruptly awakes to investigate the intrusion. Look next. Yashji Susa Padak Jihat. Padak Yija. Wait, wait, wait. Um Jiyajbe. Uh my Klingon isn't very good. And where the hell did you come from? I haven't been even been alone in a room with another Klingon since leaving Kronos for the Academy. Am I dreaming? Jiyajbe. The very serene looking being is an old but healthy Klingon who hovers toward the cadet, floating midair in the lotus position. After lowering their feet to touch the floor, after a rise in the soundtrack, the mysterious Klingon spirit responds to Teduch. Doha, Pichgakbe, Nukjabe. Doha, Doha. So, like I inquired earlier, identify yourself. Look neck. You don't recognize me? Bak. This is okay, young warrior, for I am not a Dahar, but Basai. I am here helping you understand your inner independence. For songs and stories are not invented, but discovered. I have held the wisdom of the ancient poets and philosophers of Kronos since before the times of Kalish. Heed my warning. If you do not accept and complete your journey, you will recover, you will not recover from your circumstances. Be certain, young Klingon, you were not accepted by the human engineered implant. Your DNA wouldn't even bother to register it. Are you not still manic and in counseling with that trill? Remembering the implant's removal prior to sinking into the dream, Taydok is confused by his lingering symptoms. The human peers had experienced full recovery upon removal, yet his symptoms linger on. Please don't call me warrior. I don't like it. Reminds me of Kronos and the facade they employ there. Tell me this, poet. What do you know of my struggles? Do you know what it's like to be killed or exiled for being an honest, hardworking member of society that differs from the flocking followers of blind ignorance? I will not be bent over into submission. Ah! What do you, the old customs and ways still plague the caverns of my mind's eye? Perhaps you are not understanding me, young Klingon. I wish for you to discover your woka. You must embrace your other way in order to survive. Without integrating yourself with the kib, you will never be balanced in serene peace. Maybe I don't want to be balanced. I certainly don't want to be uh, Klingon any. This much is clear. Heed my wisdom, young cadet of soul, born of Kronos. Seek out your inner truth on the plain of Toma, and you will find flowering fruit for forage. Kong, Kong Hab, some. Perhaps you will find your place yet if you can do the battling of a warrior and transcend the ego of Nukpat. Whatever you do, continue to study yourself under the doctor's direction and do not give in to the tyrannical trauma that you may experience trying to explore your own purpose, identity, and personal perception of Parmach. The ghostly spirit turns toward the wall as if to leave, but intuitively turns around as if he knows Teduk will respond. Teduk springs forward to the foot of the bed and kneels down to both knees and pleads. I don't fully understand how you know so much about me. I've only heard of stories that include legends of poets, artists, musicians, and philosophers. Most of the time on Kronos and in Klingon society, we raged war or find far reaches of the galaxy to start it. 
I also rem remember the word and and accept your charge, great master, from beyond the house of Kales. I don't care for Klingon culture or history, but I respect your wise teachings and will embody them respectfully. Perhaps I can uncover Basai culture if the Har Klingons would ever evolve their society to exist outside of absolute binaries and primitive corrupt justice systems. The more I think about it, the more I realize- I must go. Less, less, and return to your slumber. Pay close attention to the Wani ahead of you, cadet. Less, less. Check, cadet. Vov, kapla. In a casual trance, not hypnotic, Taeduk, without breaking his gaze, with the being rises and sits back on the foot of the bed. Taeduk, after a beat, continues without breaking gaze to get under the covers while continuing the next line. Kapo, wise master. Though I will not return to a Dahar Klingon way, I will study the Basai way of Parmach as Parmach. Not some kind of set ritual with no other forms than the binary offered on Kronos. I wish to study the art, not war. Perhaps security and tactical was a bad choice. Huh. Roth, Salser. Wait, that's the second time you referred to me as Sam. How do you know my Guicha? The Basai master turns again in a brilliant flash of white light. He disappears through the wall where he entered, Davy's private room and doors sickbay. Just as the flash dims down to evening room lighting, the Klingon cadet shoots up from the bed in a hot sweat as if just completing a long distance run in the San Francisco heat after a long day of polishing particle converters. Taduk rubs his eyes, scratches his head as he swings his large legs over to the side of the bed as, as they stare emptily out into the vastness of space viewed through a gigantic window in the corner of sickbay. Then, as they quickly lower their chin to a closed fist, propped on their knee, mirroring that of the mythological figure Atlas, a moment passes in silent thought. The only soundtrack heard is the humming crescendo of ship noise. Blackout. Transition and cutting to interior Dr. Doors Academy quarters. Interior. Doors. Oh, dark 30. That's six... 30 a.m. Dr. Doris sits at his desk and composes on an advanced typing pad that appears on a hollow screen floating midair. We observe an article he is using to support uh, that reveals the deaths and casualties from the previous day's events with the RFID malfunction. While we watch Doris type, a character montage begins, narrating the report. 33 casualties total, three deaths as of last night. Cadet David Koenig suffered massive seizure and Commander Thomas Teller died on the table of a stroke. Cut to each patient as they are mentioned in the narration. We had to remove the victim's implants in an experimental process to determine if this new hardware could be linked to the explosion of cases we saw in the first week after returning to HQ. Cut to patients having their chips removed in sickbay. We are graphically shown characters having their implants removed. Upon removal, symptoms disappear almost instantly, deducing diagnostics to tiny piece of inorganic matter that was polluting victims' bodies. All affected personnel are observed returning to stations, departments, and duties at the academy. Cut to other San Francisco campuses that are affected. We get glimpses in aerial of the Federation capital in Paris, Campuses in Philadelphia, Shanghai, Sydney, St. Petersburg, and Cairo. Dr. Doerr's report is submitted to the Chiefs of Staff for consideration of RFID requirement revocation. I am writing to pursue a work order from Engineering's RFID program and requesting a meeting with the Joint Chiefs to hear my appeal. With great respect, Lieutenant Dr. Jasper Doors, Chief Medical Officer, SFA. As the report hovers midair, completed, 
Uh, Dr. Doar signs the document with his index finger midair. Computer, forward medical briefing to Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Interstellar Ethics Committee. Screen off. The hovering reports, illumination is extinguished. Doar straightens his uniform and takes a deep Qigong fourfold breath before retiring from his desk to his bed. Lights off and blackout end act two. So that's the scene. Woo! Um, I just want to say that um, I appreciated the fact that there wasn't a lot of Klingon. Uh, that is mostly because I am an amateur myself. I did use the official dictionary and I actually had the privilege of meeting Mark Oprin. Yep, there it is. Thank you, Jesse. I have a copy. <laughs> Mine's, Mine's a lot more beat up. But uh, yeah. <laughs> from from years of you know crying, as a as a linguist, I I, I dabble in a lot of languages, um, but uh, I have to say it's the first time I really got past Kapla, uh, and uh, and it is difficult. So what I did was I you know I worked with Mark Okren about you know how you know I explained to him what the the what's the word uh, the compromise I made was that in uh, Klinglish. Klinglish. So, so I, I tried to make the Basai as Klingon as I could. And, uh, and, you know, it was easy to say, oh, Sam doesn't know. They don't, they don't know Klingon that well. So I can just, that was easy to, to do a Klingon cadet that doesn't know much. But uh, the Basai master was hard. I had to like go through that dictionary and figure out how to formulate sentences, you know, um, but it, but the real reason there isn't that much Austin is is really my my if we if this was bu budgeted by the franchise I'm sure that we would be a little more uh, putting on in there. So one of the critiques I actually did have was regarding uh, Tadeuk's uh, Klingish. Um, as someone who is uh, bilingual, and I've met a lot of different people um, of varying degrees of bilingual, I've met uh, Serbians like me who've learned English at the same time, I've learned people who had distanced themselves from uh, Serbian and lost it over the way, it didn't feel very organic. It, it was very, it did it's not how I could imagine someone switching casually, especially because more than anything, because of how different Klingon and English are. Uh, as a linguist, you'll know your mouth makes different shapes. And for me to, when I switch between languages, I'll actually develop an accent in English just because my mouth needs to conform to different shape and switching from English to something as very different to, as Klingon I don't think it would come that naturally, especially if you're not a fluent speaker. So yes, and and just to clarify for the lay people, there are institutes in Canada that that you know continue this lang this fictional language. But uh, but to answer your question, your character Sam has uh, it shouldn't feel organic. Yeah. Uh, some backstory: they aren't. You know, it's I sort of borrow from Worf's uh, life that uh, you know you're, you're kind of dealing with. You weren't necessarily uh, raised among Klingons, let's say. So, so it shouldn't feel organic. It's like, whoa, I've been speaking Klingon in years, and this guy um, is speaking all Klingon. Oh, so she's not, or they are and, not uh, switching. Oh, they're they're not like you're, you're, flawlessly you're switching. So much is trying. You're an English, you're an earth speaker, but you okay. do remember some words. Okay, from she's your, for, they're formally trying to. Yeah, you're trying okay. to keep up with the master. Uh, okay. That so there sense. is context for that. But other stuff? Uh, you also got that kind of difficulty with um, a Klingon trying to speak their own language in Voyager. Um, character yeah. of Belana Torres, but you know the different. And I saw a couple similarities here because it seems a lot like Tadok really just wants to leave Klingon culture. No interest in the history, no interest in anything. And that was very much Belana, you know. So, and there's a couple instances where she spoke Klingon, but it sounded very forced. So, I think that's a very you know good way to go about that. 
Kayla, our next great gen, great. also had a problem with wanting to balance uh, her human side and her uh, yeah. Klingon side. It's so a Klingon that's... trope. And honestly, yep. I think that, I you know, them. Klingon, that, that whole culture is another medium that we use for a lot of the things that, you know, and it's important to note that there's so many characters that are, I guess maybe this ties back to Austin's old question. A lot of these characters are hybridal. They have multiple cultures or multiple species involved, you know, and it's something that, you know, culturally, socially, sometimes uh, can be better or worse. Um, so as as um, as far as uh, the the oh, I, my point was that those characters, Belana Torres, she's part human, and right. and we can take from her visually that. The character wants to be human. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's the same thing with like colorism in India, where um, you notice how she has that heavy makeup on, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, so all these. It's all it's interesting that we're always coming back to the characters that live double laban, you know. The, so. It's also really cool because Klingon is such a, a same with the trills. It's such a favorite um, race, and it's always cool to see from their perspective why they don't like it as much as the fans like it and things like that. I also really liked um, at the end of the scene where um, Dr. Doors is talking about the failures in the technology it was really cool to me because i was as a, as austin was reading it i was thinking about we do hear about all this really cool advanced technology the 23rd century but we don't really hear about how it got to that stage the experimental phase the failure. side effects yes we don't hear about the failure yeah we're always like oh my like transporters revolutionary concept how many like limbs have we lost? I want to know. Yeah. About <laughs> Enterprise, Star Trek Enterprise. Yeah, yeah go back and watch Enterprise. They could throw that crap. <laughs> you know, and I feel um, like the I feel like the way it was written too. It almost feels like Doors is kind of numb to it at this point. It's, it's nothing that's very you know captivating to him. Like oh, thirty three casualties. But like it, the way the way it was written, and you know the way I was interpreting the reading was that he. He's seen this a lot. This is this is nothing new to him, and it's kind of almost, you know, every day this happens. So, so you, you know. are a join you are a join trill. So you've lived many lives, uh, physical lot. Many a lot physical things. beings have held your soul. Uh, so you might be just wise enough that you're calm. But just a little back note: what you're doing in that montage is this is the big theme, right? Well, this is this the right before the big this is the calm before the storm where we're kind of it's like late night you type in your little report as you and you're narrating it so that, so when you see this on the screen you wouldn't be saying these lines we would hear them as you stare intently typing to this to whatever device you have okay and, and then it would cut to the to sick bay having the different patients have the the device we're talking about is a tiny little, and remember, this is years ago I came up with this, uh, because they had this, they have this technology a couple of years ago, just like in your credit card, a chip about that size being implanted in your uh, wrist right here, or forearm. So we would see, cut to scenes where different cadets or officers or something, they're having that removed. That's what I meant by graphically. So, so it's sort of this, Calm before the part where Doors is going to save the day. Uh, so it, so it is sort of. You're right. It's kind of the way you read it was fine, very like relaxed. But this is you. This is preparing for your big hero speech, essentially. Okay. Um, I did want to say uh, when during Tadok's uh, sort of monologues. It felt a little bit on the nose regarding the whole, uh, they mentioned binary multiple times, but it felt very self-descriptive, kind of like a monologue on stage as opposed to on screen. Um, that was one thing that stood out to me when I was reading this um, before. Come down the philosophy. Yeah. Um, so More it, ambiguity. Yeah. Um, I feel like it would be, it would benefit to have it more spread out across multiple scenes rather than just within five minutes kind of like saying all of these things 
Um, Cause I get the inner monologue, but at the same time, it just doesn't come out as uh, naturally. So maybe we need to hide, I mean, this, you know, for the final project, maybe his uh, dream will be more ambiguous, more vague. Um, I, I would value saying non-binary one time, but you're right, too many, then we're, that's, that draws away from the dramaturgical tactic, um, as it were. And then last really tiny, typos. one really tiny note was the Basai person floating down in lotus position. Um, you would is, not hear that. You, that's what you would see. At most of the directions I read, that's stuff that you see on screen. Well, the, the only reason that I bring it up is because the lotus position, would it, it starts to, I started questioning, would other alien races also adopt a lotus position or would they have different positions that they found spiritual because we do, um, um. Yeah, I'm you you actually do see that with the Vulcans and the Bajorans. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just so like kind of like uh, like, and uh, it, you have to really be watching the screen to see it. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm limited to my to next generation. But no, knowledge. she's right okay. though. She's right. The question is a dramaturgical question: Is would the the Klingon Basai use this legs? So for anyone who doesn't know, we're talking about a person who is midair, probably about uh, Yoda. Four feet off the ground. Yeah, remember, imagine Yoda riding in his little vehicle. Okay, so about four feet off the ground with their legs crossed like they're meditating. That's now, a very like Avatar The Last Airbender yeah, Hindu I, image. That say that, <laughs> now that you say that, so maybe the Psy Master's entrance, I'll make a note, his entrance could be uh, clarified. Play with the alienness of it. It's some. It's probably something we've never seen before, or slowly got integrated. Especially if it's something as ancient as a Basai master. Well, entrances right. are important in in on the screen because it's what you see, yeah. uh, and what you see. Even the, see now, now those that didn't know before, nine well, one hundred percent of what you see. The the writer for the screenplay wrote all those notes out to to for the, the camera and editing. Uh, so, but, but, but she's absolutely correct. Um, when you're creating something organically, you want to be sure not to be uh, leading. Number one, you don't want to, I don't want to lead people to think, oh, it's this, it, you don't want it to be so associative that it loses its organic power. Very good. Okay, let's okay. find the next scene. So. Um, which is the last scene that I picked. So this is the last scene in this reading. Um, but I think it's very important because this is the scene when um, the chief of staff is drawn together to talk about um, Dr. Doors' report, basically. So, spoil alert, this is this is the, the hero speech. Yeah, and this is a, a direct continuation of the last scene that was just... Um, red. Yeah, there's no breaks. Uh, when you write for the screen, the act is just, it's all mental. The, there is no break. It's just going to cut from blackout right to the next act. So uh, if everybody, is everybody ready? Did anybody have anything to add? Okay. Thank you again. I hope, does anybody need, nobody need, okay. Take breaks as needed. Uh, we'll continue on then. Um, Thank you again, everybody, for staying with us. Um, so, Act 3 should be page 50. Interior and exterior of Starfleet Academy, late afternoon, evening. Emergency meeting of the Chiefs of Staff is convened. Though this is Dr. Doerr's third day back since the semester began, it is the first day of the fall session. Communicator badges light up on personnel in preparation for announcement. Open to all Starfleet personnel, an emergency meeting of the Interstellar Ethics Committee is being held in Cochrane Forum at 1500 hours. RFID victims are encouraged to attend. First year cadets will receive credit. Interior, Ephraim Cochrane Forum, Starfleet Academy, 1500 hours. Dr. Doors appears before the panel of administrators and chief officers 
There is an exchange of eye contact or gaze uniting Admiral Atos to signify coming transformation. Welcome officers. If all will take their respective places, we will begin. Commander Ritter approaches the stand to read from a tablet. We have here the official report completed and submitted by Lieutenant Jasper Doors, Chief Medical Officer, SFA. As many here among us have experienced and witnessed the catastrophe that befell recipients of the RFID program implant recently. This honorable committee will now hear the testimony and experiences of Dr. Doors himself. Doors rises from the audience for and proceeds to the stand. The tension of rising action has led to this climactic moment. Film time slows down, sounds drone down to a lower or up to a higher frequency maybe, but the soundtrack music to that moment when a bomb goes off in a military movie. Uh, the soundtrack music increases volume until the doctor has almost arrived at the podium and standard time will instantly return and environmental room sound returns to normal frequency. Doors approaches the podium and sets down his tablet with his report review open on it to read from and use as a projected presentation. So it's midair. Greetings, committee members, admirals, faculty, and cadets. We have gathered here today to discuss the recent requirement for personnel to attain RFID implants in their forearms. We have discovered a few malfunctions with the product that elicit dangerous and potentially fatal implications. Please, doctor, tell the forum how you have come to a knowledge of this. Turning doors faces the committee. By firsthand experience, Admiral, we've been flooded with cases of, as reported, Gnostic disorders, seizures, motricity mutations, and stroke. We have had 33 cases and counting. And a lot of this matters. Federation purchased the program properly and coordinated an overhaul and sweep check. The Academy School of Engineering and Technology handled the transaction. Also, as you know from your personnel file, one may deduce that you never received the mandatory implant, nor did other faculty that could produce waivers or dispensations. I am not on trial here, sir. Really, uh, Lieutenant? Because it seems as though you are attempting to create a case against the Federation here. What are your intentions? To prove that these implants must be removed. Let the committee know and all present that three have died from the malfunction in the chip. And more may follow if we do not shut down the program and excise the implants. The fact of the matter, we knew the probable possible, uh, possibles perceptually since Earth year 2017, but proceeded with the mandate regardless of centuries old scientific query. Yes, Lieutenant, but what? Sir, with, with all due respect, cadets are dying here on campus and we are receiving reports from Paris Philadelphia, and Cairo, while more transfer communications daily. I don't think that any amount of big business could sway my mind. Yes, but... And yes, sir, I did have a medical dispensation. As a joint trill, we cannot disturb our bodies with inorganic materials. This would risk damage to the trill host, potentially severing my embodiment of the symbiote. And I am lucky to not have received an implant. In an alternative situation, I may not have been clear-minded enough to discover these phenomena. It was approved and accepted by the board and you are correct, doctor. You are not on trial here. Please continue. Another issue we take besides the casualties is bad press Starfleet may receive. Doors pauses for a moment before letting out a sigh. Just before Doors begins to speak, we see Taydok appear leaning in a doorway and the two make eye contact. If it's a matter of bad engineering, then fine, we can get to the bottom of it and fix it if it's fixable. But for now, admirals, committee, and faculty, please let me get the chips out of our cadets and officers. They only seem to work on humans anyway. Trills can conscientiously object while implant never activates in Klingon physiology. Vulcans also tend to either object or their anatomy rejects the chip. Taylor smiles in appreciation. We are not asking for unicorns or for Admiral Janeway to walk through the main doors in this hallowed hall for Ephraim Cochran. We are requesting revocation of the RFID program until further notice. Additionally, an investigation should be launched in the initial acquisition of the program, what led to its negligent recasting. Lieutenant Doors, 
You are aware that we could easily program a unicorn, Kate Janaway, and Old Cochran by stepping into a hollow suite or visit or visiting a hollow debt. Enough, Commander. Doctor, do you wish to say anything further? Simply this. It is in my most professional medical opinion that these implants are the root of the recent developing incidents based off our experimental diagnostics. We understand that programs are often recycled, but it may be acknowledged that reconstituted tech runs risky rides upon the chain links of negative possibility. More importantly, when we did start putting together hardware in our people, are we bored now? Will we be entering a transhuman dialectic that will make us more robotic than Cathonic? Emeritus, I don't understand why you cannot fathom the computational brain. We have mastered existential algorithms and Volson physiognomy. We are uploading consciousness and creating artificial intelligence daily. What could possibly... Damn it, sir, I'm a doctor, not a software programmer. Interstellar species and conscious beings follow certain loops in programming, sure. Additionally, each subject in the world is environmentally and linguistically constructed. But we are certainly not computers. We are living, breathing, and becoming. We are more like flowers and weeds than computational tools. Mycology has taught us that fungi like mushrooms share more common DNA in common with hominids than their plant neighbors. We live in the vain pursuit of life, discovering purpose, not necessarily meaning as many have misinterpreted existence before us. I have said that all the, that is all that need to be said for now. Your metaphysical algorithms are absolute and therefore not applicable to the science of existential phenomena. We are not talking about Vulcan mind tricks, but an actual kinesonomic phenomenology of live space. Sirs, recall the implants, investigate the engineering reports, and honor the victims of this horribly traumatic tragedy. Thank you, Admiral Atos. Commander Ryder and the committee for their time. Doors takes his seat as some of the crowd, recognized as some of Doors students, cheer and glory for his triumphant speech. So everybody, woo! Crawl wraps the gavel four times before the forum returns to orderly silence. Ritter approaches the stand and exchanges whispered communication with Crawl. The committee and executive panel will now take a short recess to deliberate the evidence and materials presented and submitted here today. We will reconvene in 15 minutes. The committee panel retires to a back office while the forum's collective noise volume slightly rises with the conversations beginning in the room. Taydoff joins doors by walking down to his row and taking a seat in support. Singh is seen limping toward them with Meta aiding his wobble. Additionally, David and Lisa arrive at the forum to stand in support of the good doctor. A discussion sparks among protagonists in the scene. What do they really have to deliberate about? They have to think, uh, they have to think about or discuss a human rights issue? Until my implant was removed, I couldn't speak. I didn't know if I would again, just in time to finish the Positronics project. Oh, wow. You're still working on her? You need to have precise measurements when you quantify the frontal cortex of the... Are you here to work, math boy, or find out the fate of the Starfleet universe? No work, not talking about Unit 2514. I really want to hear the committee's final declaration, because protest may continue if these chips are not recalled. Oh, unmute. <laughs> the worst part is, Engineering Lab is in Bedlam over this. I heard a few other cadets mention a headhunt. Headhunt? Uh, yes. They're trying to trace the program's conversion team roster to figure out who altered the system. Good. I'm glad. Forget about dishonor and justice. Whomever is, is responsible for this catastrophe has committed crimes against humanity. All life, terrestrial or alien, to feel safe in any and all regulations that are in place. To require one to be implanted with a computer identification device is a weak attempt to quantify identity by force. A highly illogical action. How long has it been? The sooner they declare their motion, the Morocco and down in engineering will be exposed. We notice an officer in engineering tan uniform uh, adjacent to the group 
make a face that implicates an expression of guilt. No. The suspect runs past the group in an attempt to flee. Tayduk is twice as fast and catches up. Just as the suspect was almost reaching the nearest exit, the Klingon tackles and pins down the officer. As a tactical and security cadet, Tayduk immediately arrests and detains them. Where were we? Where were we headed in such a hurry, Commander? Oh no, no! He begins sprinting for the exit. Tayduk, having the, the other engineer, Tayduk, having already apprehended suspect one, leaves them with the group to pursue suspect two. Tayduk is successful and tackles and pins again. Before he finishes applying cuffs, the other suspect across the forum begins seizing violently and dying in David and Lisa's arms. Tayduk throws suspect two over his big shoulder and returns to the group. As suspect one lay foaming at the mouth lifelessly, suspect two wriggles off the Klingon's shoulder and falls to the ground. What the hell is going on? I want answers now. What's the story here? Your partner doesn't look so good. Will you be joining him? Well, sir, no. As his superior operative, I was never implanted with a chip. He had to submit to a chip implant in order to infiltrate Starfleet undercover. He had to do nothing. Answer me, scum. What did you do? Why is my sick base so damn busy? Taking suspect two by the collar. All right, all right. We were deployed by an outside organization. We were agents hired to infiltrate Starfleet in order to sabotage the Federation efforts. Crash! I will make gawk of you, petty criminal. Wait, wait. We couldn't have, predict we couldn't have predicted the mortricity malfunctions or the other side effects, but I can tell you that when the program was introduced to engineering, I did not convert the technology properly. When adopting the cybernetic matrix, as soon as we brought it online, the problems began. Having heard the commotion of suspect one's death, some of the committee returned to the room to investigate. Crawl and Ritter approached the group to interject. Nathan's muted. What problems? That still doesn't explain the seizures and strokes. Or accurate. Uh, Come on, pharmacist. <laughs> that apraxia? Cute apraxia. apraxia. Thank you. That other syndicate agent just seized in front of us until dying of what, doctor? Cardiac arrest. It was a heart attack. Because of you, we have lived through four deaths today at Starfleet's oldest home. What is the origin of the RFD project now? Start talking. You will only get so many chances. Unmute Tim. Oh, I'm sorry. The implants were adapted from an old military design for, design for espionage. They were equipped with control devices including induced death should the subject be captured or tortured. During clinical trials, we realized that normal termination would malfunction. Instead of instant painless death, test subjects would seize. Lisa pushes Tejuf and doors aside to lay a potent punch into the syndicate agent's face that breaks their nose and bruises the cheek and eye. Yeah. Lisa! Tayduk, let's get this Gok file down to the brig and lock him up. We're going to put a stop to this. Tayduk scoops up the small man confidently. No, you won't. You will never stop the movement. We are a global syndicate that will stop at nothing to wreak havoc on the Federation and shut down the fascist cult known as Starfleet Program. And then we... Tayduk punches them in the mouth to interrupt. Sorry, Lieutenant. Lisa had a point. Ow! Damn Klingons! You, yeah. How do you like that? A Klingon with a sense of humor. What's your name? 
I would like to be called Sam. I am Sam Nock of San Francisco. The Klingon picks up the small human and escorts him in a cell in the brig. The panel reconvenes after the enlightening event as personnel take their seats, Crawl wraps the gavel four times before all are seated. Ritter passes the stand and whispers with Crawl before continuing on, approaching the podium. Welcome back, everyone. In light of recent events we experienced in this situation, juxtaposed Dr. Doerr's report, this committee and the Joint Chiefs of Staff have no choice but to repeal the RFID program. All chips are to be removed as soon as possible. The memorial service is to be held honoring the victims of these crimes. Cheers are heard, crawl wraps twice before their rejoicing dies down for Ritter to continue. Furthermore, security and tactical will perform a thorough investigation into this engineering fiasco and put into place measures for future determinant. Thank you. And Admiral, your final word? Thank you all again, Dr. Doors. We are eternally grateful and in debt to your faithful Federation service. Your research and report has been recorded into Starfleet's computer system. And while we will not miss this again, we must open our eyes and keep our heads on a swivel in pursuit of this new intergalactic syndicate that lurks among us. Thank you all for attending. We will be holding a memorial service followed by a vigil to honor the victims of this tragedy. We will gather in the reverie gardens around 1900 hours. Candles will be provided for those who remain overnight. Again, thank you to Dr. Doors and the cadets who aided in the apprehension of these syndicate agents. Personnel gather, group, and file out of the forum. See medical staff put suspect one's corpse on a stretcher and remove it from the room. Ritter and Doors exchange a gaze of approval and acknowledgement. Cut to campus. Exterior evening. End of Act Three. So it sounds to me like you guys are going to probably need a fight choreographer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and intimacy, too. Yeah, I got that. So I got to go, but I'm available. Thank this you, Dan. Fun. We'll catch up later, bud. Fighting me. So here we are. <laughs> It was so gratifying as a lifelong trekker to be able to talk about this stuff in an actual productive context. And yay for the big speech. Every best episode has a big speech. That, it does. Like, it does. What is it to be a that man? It was intense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I almost feel like there'd be a great uh, commercial break whenever they, like right after all that action before they're like before they reconvene you know i feel like there'd be a great commercial break you if you are a loved one have been a victim of mesothelioma <laughs> <laughs> you are a yeah. loved one have been a victim of federation rfid chips so yeah. actually i wanted to ask i wanted to ask um what is the purpose what? of the trip and why is the federation so adamant about it Okay, I was gonna push the question, but it is related to the scene because um, it was a big deal of my thesis. It has a lot to do with um, quality control for AI, I guess, uh, to put it blunt, uh, lay terms. Uh, so I did a lot of research in artificial consciousness, and that's where I came up with the idea of how do you regulate it through interviews. It's like being a psychologist for a robot. Uh, but uh, but as far as the chips were concerned. I had discovered in 2017 that it was a real technology. Even things, they even have things as crazy, like, uh, I mean, not, I don't, I don't know everything in the world, what countries are doing what secretively, but supposedly there's something on the market in the world that like a little piece of plastic or something that a spy can walk up, put it on the back of your head and you're paralyzed or something like that. So I got curious about, well, what other stuff is that out there? And I saw this, chip and and there's all the conspiracy theories of they're preparing us for that by putting it in our other cards and all that stuff so oh, and our vaccines for the coronavirus right. yeah. now that happened so again this is another one of those topics that i was thinking about a couple of years ago that is also now kind of a it is very highly relatable in other fashions um because they think that that if because if you can put a chip the chip when you get a, your animal chip like my dog behind me they put the chip in via syringe. 
So, and we have nanobots for a long time. So the, the conspiracy is that they could do, they could implant whatever they wanted. Um, so the idea is that in Star Trek, it was a mandatory requirement for Starfleet personnel. So it's something totally uh, tame on the surface, but was actually administered by bad people in high ranking good guy status. So they were able to do something a little bit like good or normal, something beeps. Uh, uh, that was my computer. Red alert. <laughs> but it's really, um, you know, maybe something sinister below there. And that's sort of my whole thesis with AI quality control is like, this stuff is amazing. Technology is amazing uh, when it has its checks and balances for, for humans. Uh, that Then we can later, we'll, you know, the whole transhuman, this is also transhuman, you know what, this is exactly what it is. It's the post-humanism versus transhumanism, which is, one is transhumanism, which is commonly, it's people that want to enhance the human experience through technology. So at, so essentially the goal is a cyborg, a human, which, which primitively speaking, that gets us, draws us back to things like the cochlear and other implants to make your disability normal or whatever. Um, and, and so the idea is that, um, what other kind of bad stuff uh, could it lead to? Because um, technology is great, but unless you're going to prevent, you know, going too far as they do. We're living a sci-fi uh, movie right now. Everybody feels that. But that's sort of uh, that's sort of a big deal is making sure that the, the mad scientist doesn't uh, make monsters or robots and, and all that or, or if you know, they're already AI is already here, and they're already working on humanoidal robots. The question, and I mean, if we're gonna take it real dark and X-rated, there's those uh, sex dolls and stuff. All you gotta do is put AI in it, right? Uh, so then I'm drawing a conspiracy conclusion that you don't, you don't even know if your neighbor's a robot or not. So, so I just think that they would try to administer it in a way like, oh, everybody has to get their chip so we can keep track of you while you're flying throughout space with your crew. But like, it has these side effects that actually hurts people and um, doesn't really have any beneficial. And it doesn't even, like with the case of Tato, it didn't do anything for him. It just made him sick and not feel good. It did, yeah, it did. I really liked, uh, I really liked the whole human centrism thing. It definitely parallels what we're going on, right? What's going on in day to day stuff, like the prejudice for caring only about certain type of people wanting other types of people to adapt to the norm. They want the alien races to adapt to the humans rather than adapting the technologies to the alien races. Um, but uh, with all that, I also wanted to ask where, we, no, now no Picard spoilers because I haven't watched it yet, but where are we in this scene in terms of Borgness? Borgness? Borgness. So, so uh, yeah, and it, again, it's hard because, uh, you know, Picard came out, Discovery came out, so that's all new stuff to adapt to. Um, but the, there are Borg, uh, but as far as uh, I'd have to, defer to Jesse to try and pull us in dramaturgically where we'd be in timeline. Hence mm -hmm. why I kind of left the timeline up to whoever ends up, you know, if this ever gets made, you know, timeline would be up to the experts. I um, didn't have a preference. Uh, well, if you have a Klingon at Starfleet Academy, it's definitely 24th century. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was curious because that would definitely change people's opinions. Like, are we good? Are we cool with the Borg? Are we not cool with the Borg? How do we feel about a integrating AI into... Okay, so long term, uh, mm -hmm. the, the arc of the season would include... I originally wrote a couple of post-Borg cadets. Uh, so we would really get into it by mm -hmm. seeing a couple of sub-protagonists... Uh, cadets that were post-Borg because we have a lot of post-Borg, especially in the card right now. So yeah. It's fresh. Uh, but the, the real thing, so just to clarify that topic of post-humanism versus transhumanism, one is about leaving the human body behind for the sake of immortality. Okay. Whereas the other one, post-humanism philosophy is more 
it's less about getting rid of humans and things that are human. Uh, it's more about being beyond the human condition. So in other words, like thinking from an unbiased way. So outside of the, um, in phenomenology, we call it epige. So you do, you do your best to study all the, the subjective and objective information, and then you make that um, call with a certain um, frame of mind that would be sort of beyond your own biases and human, the things that make human make bad choices. So trying to meditate out of that would be post-human. Whereas transhumanism is the, the goal is to be immortal by adding AI or robotic parts or whatever, like the Borg, that, that concept is transhumanism. Hey, Josh, I got to back up just two quick things. One, uh, I love the call back to Bones McCoy. Um, <laughs> I laughed out loud, actually. Um, awesome and the second thing on the AI front, if you've not seen the British series um, Black Mirror, uh, it's love on it. Netflix. Love it's it. Awesome. goes right down the same road. There's actually a Star Trek episode, themed episode. Yes, there is. <laughs> Star Trek gone bad. Thank you so much, Tim. We're happy to have you. Enjoyed it. Thanks. Nice to meet you guys. Hi, Tim. Oh. <laughs> Trying. Um, so, so on the topic of uh, humanities, you know, I think another um, piece of uh, media that that's really um, exploring that boundary is Westworld. I think Westworld does. Absolutely, very, another. Yeah. That is exactly what I was binging when I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been working on this? Like, when did uh, well, you start this? This, okay, so uh, I I spent about a, it took me like two years, I get almost a year, year and a half of research and kind of nonlinear scene writing. So I wrote the the scene with Ritter and Crawl, the, you know, the hero returns, typical. And I also wrote Tedu's dream sequence. Those were the first two scenes. And then the rest kind of came along you know, meditating through the research, writing the thesis paper, all that kind of brought a lot of these things to life. So um, I didn't waste any time when we started introducing myself. I'm Josh. I'm, I kind of do a little of every math. Uh, what do they say? I'm a uh, jack of all trades, master of some, some. Uh, so, so I do write, but I also get to think a little bit on more on the level of directing and acting, having uh, an experience with that as well. But uh, yeah, um, I forget what that, where, what was that question? Westworld. Oh. Westworld, yeah. So uh, when I think about a fictional equivalent of like my, you know, the way I'm thinking with the whole uh, cybernetic uh, interviews was based a uh, similar to Bernard, uh, who well, I won't no spoilers about Bernard, but Bernard is a character in Westworld who that's what he does. He de conducts interviews with the the androids almost the way a human therapist would with a human, because we've made and you know Blade Runner more human than human. We we're on the course to make AI more human than human. So how do you how do you control you know controls a shitty word bad sorry bad word for uh, Controls a bad word for, for, you know, a positive takeaway from sci-fi. Uh, but mitigate, maybe. Mitigate. Yep. To mitigate AI, you have to maybe think on some of these more human levels as you get that to be so uh, superior to other computer uh, computer um, technology. You know, at, at what point do we need to think like a human to mitigate a Robot, you know, beyond coding. I mean, coding, yeah, okay, coding would make it move and talk and and have all these other things out of it. But beyond the coding, if it can achieve that, you know, how do we mitigate? But yeah, so I'm glad that we're everybody's hitting everything just there. So is there other stuff from the end scene before we uh, proceed to kind of do a final reaction? 
really minor thing, but because the doctor character said it, I have to say something. In EMT class, they distinctly taught us there is a difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack. It's not the same thing. Uh, okay. Heart attack is when uh, when it, it's a blockage, whereas cardiac arrest is where the heart stops pumping altogether and it's an electrical problem. So one of the symptoms of the, the chip for, for victims was um, stroke. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I 100% and was not qualified on that word with the heart attack versus or cardiac arrest. But what I would do there is it's really just a window for Star Trek canon to put something else that happens to people. Oh, no, it's just when the antagonist uh, has it, the doctor character said that he had a heart attack, cardiac arrest. Uh, well, he says he both of them. With the whatever the Star Trek equivalent yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying it would, be, it would be one or the other. Um, they're not interchangeable. Oh, I used to. Okay, I see. Yeah, it, it really <laughs> minor thing, but yeah. Everything people say, I'm I'm trying to make notes because I want to fix it for it before important people. Oh, oh, yeah, before other people Ouch. see. It. Ouch. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. Everybody hears uh -huh. everything, uh -huh. and and I'm grateful that that we're able to get a nice spectrum and group of people. Um, so, were there other gotcha. things about the final scene? Otherwise, we can go around the horn for final reactions. I like the part where Lisa punched the guy in the face. That was beautiful. How often, does a, how often does a female character character get to be like a badass professor who also gets to be like kind of cute sometimes and then punch someone in the face? And that's yeah, 30 yeah, pages. That's Star Trek for you. <laughs> like super smart, working on a positronic brain. <laughs> yes. Uh, I like the depth to, to Lisa. She is very much ideally the main protagonist, being that it's sort of a, a Bechtel driven piece. Um, any, and if you're not familiar with the Bechtel test, in two seconds, I'll tell you. Uh, there's a, a famous author named Alison Bechtel. She wrote the graphic novel Fun Home that was developed into a Broadway musical, uh, no wait, play. I, I got to see it myself in the round on Broadway. Um, and uh, um, so what the way the Bechtel test works is it's, it's, a, it's a tool to combat anti-feminism or anti whatever abject group on the screen. So what you're supposed to do with your script and then the finished project, of course, is make sure that you have three things. In it, 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 and the amount of times you do this uh, can give you a, a Bechtel test score, so to speak. Uh, so thinking empirically about very, very important emotional things. Um, so what it is is that you have to have a scene that has a woman, a female character, more than one, so usually two or more characters that are female, they have to be talking, they have to be talking to each other, and the key part that makes it a Bechtel test is that when those female characters speak, they do not talk about men or anything to do with the male characters. I like see lots of nods from okay. the ladies. A lot harder than people seem to think. And I really appreciate that you actually keep it in mind without making it sort of, hey, look, I got the Bechtel test. I'm doing the Bechtel test. Because you also get that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's very, very near and dear to me on the same level as the other abject. It, you know, any kind of othering I'm like obsessed with, like especially when it involves uh, suffering. So, uh, you know, for literary theory, feminism was huge for me. Um, but I, huge, I never say that word, but you know, seems to be popular huge. with people I don't like. But anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, I I very much, it's not a thing to me where I'm like, oh, empirically, we got to do the Bechtel test to make sure. No, it's not like that. To me, it's very important that um, other things are represented on the screen and done in I'm happy that there's a test that we can gauge it by. It makes it easy when you're, you know, you might do a project and think, yeah, I did a lot of justice. You know, I, I wrote the first right. Trust me, my first draft, I went through, I was like, because there's like a thing that calculates those things. There's an AI. Yeah, I'm using AI to, to tell me what's in my piece. And, and I found out how hard it really is to have 
it's not just having a leading lady. It's having multiple women in a scene or multiple, sorry, I should say women lady. It should be multiple female characters in a scene talking to each other and not about men or what men are doing. And there's lots of great shows out there that do that. Like, and not that. changing how they're written. Like, um, I was just watching Wonder Woman came on uh, came on TV the other day, and you can see such a rift between how the Amazons are portrayed by a female um, director and versus the Amazons in Justice League uh, with a male director. And I'm sure the costume designers were also respectively female and male. Um, and you can tell the difference based on something just organically happening because, hey, that's just what it is. And then, hey, look, we put extra effort and making them look strong, even though they right. completely nerfed them <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Like, no, you did good. You you were on the previous end of the spectrum of like, it's organic. You didn't have, you didn't shove in, they're women. They do women stuff, but they're cool. That's the other yes. thing is, is when they speak, they're not talking about women, women's things. They're they're just humans. Like they're talking about the are. job. Yeah. And you still accept the fact that they are women because then on the other end, you also have people who are like, in order to make a badass female character, I'm essentially gonna make Superman with boobs, which right. is not the same. Like you can't just tack on a male character and be like and now they're female because there are differences in terms of yeah. how we're treated we're raised personalities things like that so now you did a good job with that I, um, I really appreciate you bringing up the wonder woman discourse because that is we probably took uh some, one of the same classes or something american studies but no. uh, but well there's a whole class on the discourse of exactly what you're talking about yeah. where you know, uh, Wonder Woman at, at its first, it was so it was so great that there was a, a leading female, but it was written by a man, I think with the help of his wife, maybe. But but uh, but it was very how do we feminize Superman as opposed to let's have an original female superhero? Yeah, no, um, I, I transferred um, to Penn State, so I missed a lot of the uh, gen eds. But no, I did take a class. It was called Being a Woman. <laughs> Hey. Sounds good. <laughs> so um, I'll backtrack, but can I borrow the phrase "Superman with boobs" for my Tinder? Please, please. I came <laughs> up with that the other day. Like I was watching Wonder Woman, I was trying to figure out like where people go wrong, and I was like, because they do Superman with boobs. Yeah. Don't even. Like, what's the thing is in 2020. Boobs do not make you, do not determine your sex or gender or sexuality. Three different things. Now, it was more so, uh, it, it's more so just a commentary on how they're like, they don't, a lot of right. people don't know how to write an actual female character and they feel like they can just appease the audience by just fem it, what you said, feminizing a male character instead of making something. Uh, now, that's not to say that like, like I wasn't glorifying the male character originally. I just mean that you gotta accept it's currently the baseline. Even even it being 2020, right now it's still the baseline. Like most people are automatically like, oh, it's a male character. You still have the problem where you hear doctor and people assume that it's male, that they're male and things like that. So we finally stopped saying actress. Yeah. Uh -huh. But anyway, that. So I I'm glad All that. Right. Hey, uh, yeah. real quick here, Josh. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun doing this day. I actually got a dart. So I also have a couple of things to do. Um, I will get I back to you later with some stuff, but I had a lot of fun. I'll say you did. You put a great script together. It's a great storyline. I really hope this goes somewhere. I really do. Hang on was fun to listen to. Oh, thank you. I try. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Jesse, you really, uh, you took a, you, you helped a lot because we had been sort of estranged and then this project came along and then we, hung out a couple of times and you really yeah. educated yeah. me. And so I, I hope that you read it and we're like, okay, he's not a complete noob. <laughs> uh, no, you I, used actual terminology, used actual techno babble. You know, I, I was, I was a late that. bloomer to track. Right. And you know, it's interesting because people who are late bloomers to Star Trek who get into it more in their adult years, they find it very difficult to wrap their mind around it. 
uh, in my experience, it's something you kind of got to be raised with. I mean, both my parents are Trekkies, but my dad was born in 59 and my mom in 63. So they grew up with the originals and the movies and then every TV series since. Um, but uh, I, I think it, it, you, 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 you did honor to Gene Roddenberry's vision with this, with how you wrote a lot of the stuff. I did honor and especially the guy wasn't very nice. <laughs> well, you know, but it's... <laughs> I, say, oh, I did know, honor I, to everyone involved with the exactly the exactly uh rick merman alex kutzman yeah it's just like just I, not the guy in charge of enterprise <laughs> whatever the heck that was about <laughs> so much, Jesse. i'm very grateful we'll catch up soon all right man all right sounds good josh all right see everybody good meeting you right, other final Bye. reactions okay. Later. um so um you can go jesse that's fine okay all right bye-bye <laughs> um so I think that that's a lot of good discussion for the day. And I think that um, we're at a spot where we can stop live streaming. But um, if you have any questions for Josh, those watching at home, you can put them in the comments. We'll relay them to Josh perfectly. And then once I end the live stream, the rest of you, if you want to keep discussing, the Zoom room is going to be open. You can certainly do that. Um, but... Just everyone at home, um, the Pharmacy Theater's little plug. Um, in two weeks, there's another workshop live for a play called Emma, um, which discusses a coming-of-age story when Emma is struggling with her sexuality when she notices a girl for the first time, and she tries to find someone to confide in, whether that being her boyfriend, her father, her therapist. Um, she is on that journey there. And then two weeks after that, there is a workshop live for called Scarlet Letter, the Bible Belt 1965, which is a modern retelling of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The um, Scarlet Letter. But this focuses again on a um, evangelical lesbian and conversion therapy um, to try to figure out um, what are all the skeletons in the closet of a Southern church so those two things are coming up in the next month um plenty of more things being added so always um, stay tuned um, to our facebook and website those things get updated weekly so without further ado let's all thank josh for writing this piece <laughs>